So physicists were really excited when they discovered that the electric force and magnetic force were aspects of the same force known as the electromagnetic force. So this was really consolidated in James Clerk Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism which was published in 1865. We'll be looking at this at the very end of the electromagnetism section in the course. But ever since then, physicists have been looking for grand unified theories which unite the other four fundamental forces. So we've got the gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and the weak nuclear force. Now some of the very first evidence of the deep links between electricity and magnetism was discovered by the Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted in 1820. So the story goes that he was giving a public lecture where he had some demo demonstrations somewhat similar to these ones. He sent a really strong current through a wire and he noticed that this caused the compass needles to, to deflect. So we can see that here. Or here. So from this, Ørsted concluded that current carrying wires produce a magnetic field and we can actually work out the direction of the magnetic field using the right hand screw rule. So just as with our other right hand rule, our fingers represent the magnetic field lines because there's lots of them and our thumb now represents the direction of the current. So our fingers then wrap around showing the direction of the magnetic field lines. So physicists really like quantitative relationships. So it's great that we know that a current carrying wire produces a magnetic field and that we can measure the direction of that magnetic field. But what we'd really like to know is, well, how big is that magnetic field? Well, at the same time, French scientists Jean-Baptiste Biot and Félix Savart, I'm really sorry if I mangled the French pronunciation, were doing lots of experiments and they came up with something known as the Biot-Savart law. Now, with the Biot-Savart law, if you imagine this setup here where we've got a current carrying wire, so the current through the wire is I, and we're considering just a small increment of that wire with the length ds. And the question we want to know is, well, how much magnetic field does just that small increment of current produce at point P, which is the distance R from ds? Well, they discovered this can be calculated with the equation db is equal to mu naught over 4 pi i ds cross r hat divided by r squared. Now in this equation mu naught is the permeability of free space. So permeability is a measure of the resistance of a material to the formation of magnetic fields in that material. So the permeability for free space is equal to 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 newtons ampere to the minus 2. R is the distance between the point ds and the point p and in this equation we've split it into a unit vector to indicate the direction pointing from ds to p and then on the bottom we've got the magnitude squared. So this is another inverse square law. So in many ways the Biot-Savart law is a bit like Coulomb's law is for charges only for mag the magnetic field created by a current carrying wire. So it tells us how much magnetic field a small increment of current carrying wire creates. So let's have a look now at how we can calculate the magnetic field around and inside an infinite current carrying wire using the Biot-Savart law. So what we're going to do now is calculate the magnetic field at this point P due to this entire infinite wire. So in order to do that we're going to start by considering a little increment here which is a distance x away from the point vertically below P and we'll give this little increment a length dx. So we'll be using the Biot-Savart law which tells us that dB is equal to mu naught over 4 pi times i and then we've got dx in this case cross r hat. So r is the vector going from that dx up to here. So this is the vector r here and it's going to have a length equal to the square root of a squared plus x squared. 
and then we divide by r squared. So let's now work through this one little bit at a time. So let's start with dx cross r hat. So r hat is a unit vector, so it's not going to contribute to the magnitude, but it will to the direction. So this will be equal to dx times sine of phi, where phi is the angle between dx, which is this direction, and r. So that's this is phi in here. Now, because this is sine, the sine of this angle here is going to be the same as the sine of this angle in here. So we can write this as dx times sine of 180 or pi minus phi. And then if we call this angle up here theta, we know that theta plus pi minus phi are going to sum to give 90 degrees. So using our trig rules, we can write this as dx cos theta. And then this is a vector, it does have a direction, and the direction in this case is out of the screen. So we should also evaluate r squared, because we've got r is equal to the square root of a squared plus x squared, so r squared is equal to a squared plus x squared. So let's substitute these in now to our equation here. So we've got this as mu naught divided by four pi, then times i, and then we've got dx cos theta, and that's out of the screen. I won't write out of the screen again, but we'll remember that's the direction. And then divide by a squared plus x squared. So we've now got an expression, but now it's a bit yuck because we've got two variables here. We've got the theta variable and also the x variable. So um, we want this in terms of just theta or x. So we can choose either, but let's go with getting it in terms of theta. So looking at theta here, we can say, well, tan theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. So that's x over a. So we can write, well, x is equal to a tan theta. So now we can differentiate this and we've got dx d theta is equal to a sec squared theta. That's just one of the standard integrals. So now we can use this to replace the dx with a d theta. So dx is equal to a sec squared d theta. But we've also got an a squared plus x squared. So we can say, well, a squared plus x squared is equal to a squared plus we've seen x is equal to a tan theta. So this is a squared tan squared theta, which is equal to a squared outside of 1 plus tan squared theta. And then possibly you recognize this because we've got sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1. So if we divide that by sine squared theta, we end up with 1 plus tan squared theta is equal to sec squared theta. So we can write this as a squared sec squared theta. So now what we'll do is we'll substitute these back in up here. So we've now got, well, dB is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi times, rather than dx now, we will replace it with d theta. So we've got a sec squared theta d theta times the cos theta is still there. And then we're dividing by a squared plus x squared, which is a squared sec squared theta. So you can see the sec squared thetas cancel out and one of the a's cancels here. And so we've got this is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi times cos theta d theta divided by a. Now what we wanted to do was work out what's the magnetic field at p due to the entire wire. So we've just worked it out due to this little increment dx here. So we're going to need to sum all along here. So at the furthest point out here, theta is going to be minus 90 degrees or minus pi on 2. And then at the furthest point along this way, theta is going to be pi on 2. So we'll end up with b is equal to the integral of this from minus pi on 2 to pi on 2 of mu naught i over 4 pi a and then cos theta d theta. So doing this integral, we can just pull the constants out the front, mu naught i over 4 pi 
a and then we need to integrate cos theta d theta which isn't hard we've got sine theta from pi on well from minus pi on 2 up to pi on 2 and then we can just substitute these in and we've got mu naught i over 4 pi a when we substitute in sine pi on 2 minus sine of minus pi on 2 and so this is equal to mu naught i over 4 pi a and then this is 1 and this is minus minus 1 and so we end up with 2 mu naught i over 4 pi a and the 2 will cancel part of the 4 and so we'll end up with mu naught i over 2 pi a and we have our direction up here out of the screen. So now we should just check this with our right hand rule. So if you point your thumb in the direction of the current with your right hand, you can see that the magnetic field lines should be coming out of the screen at P. So we did this direction properly. And we've now got an expression for the magnetic field of an infinite current carrying wire.